first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this course. Um, I don't know the level of what you know and what you don't know. So I would appreciate if I say something you don't know to raise a hand and say, oh, can you explain this? What do you mean by that? Um, and the same way, if I start becoming too boring, repeating things that you know, except the other speakers, please raise your hand and say, well, you know, that's, uh, that's too much. We know how to add. Okay, I'm not going to start at that level. So, um, and again, uh, during the breaks, feel free to ask me uh, any questions you have. So what I, I, I offer to present, it's something that goes back uh, many years, and uh, of course things have been happening to it as we are moving on. But I will start with some things that um, happened a long time ago, so long that when I tried to prepare the first lecture and uh, I looked at some of my old papers, I had to um, think a little bit to figure out what the heck we, I had written down some time ago. <laughs> And it was a challenge. OK, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, the plan of the class is to um, discuss in, in some detail uh, some definitions of, for a generalized front pro evolution of fronts. And when I say evolution of fronts, typically I have in mind mean curvature plus something else. And I want to describe um, what you heard, like the level set method, and explain a little bit how it works. Uh, so the first thing will be level set. Then I want to describe a little bit, a very closely related approach using the distance function. And then I want to describe a more geometric notion. And uh, I want to use all of them to study a little bit, uh, discuss a little bit phase field theory, which is um, one of these uh, heavy sounding words to describe, to talk about, um, let me put some more words here, uh, phenomenological I don't know, maybe I put too many O's here. Phenomenological approach to, to phase transitions. Or, in the words that everybody understands, is uh, scaling limits of reaction diffusion equations. And then I will sketch, but I will not describe it because it's hard to do it on the blackboard, um, the, um, the opposite thing, which is the microscopic. So phenomenological is microscopic, microscopic uh, limits of particle systems. And finally, uh, I want to touch upon uh, motions of interfaces with random velocity. Now, I will not be able to, to do all this, and uh, it depends on how much material I have to review. So, aside from that, how many of you, because a lot of the tools, if not all of them, will come from uh, uh, the theory of viscosity solutions. How many of you know what that means? Uh, feel free to say, if you don't know, you don't know. So only four of you. OK, so um, uh, we'll make the deal. Uh, I will use it now without saying, uh, just saying what it is and state some theorems. And uh, then, uh, by my afternoon lecture, you go and read about it, and you come back. No, I think what I will do is, uh, an aside, if you are willing to do it, because if I add that, if I put here a zero, uh, uh, something, I mean, some of viscosity solutions, 
I'm afraid you're going to be stuck with me for a long time. So let's see how it goes. If I can do it, I can, or otherwise, for those of you who are interested, we can meet uh, during a break or something for half an hour, and I can give you the key elements of the theory. Okay, so, uh, so let's start from here. And um, there is a difference between the courses you saw last week in terms of mean curvature, motion and motion of interfaces and the way I'm, what I'm going to describe today. What I assume you heard last time, uh, last week, was smooth things evolving and figuring out when they, are not sing when they have singularities, what is the nature of the singularity. I would say that was basically, what, not basically, I mean, that's a very important uh, area. So uh, the, the approach I'm going to take, or the level set theory it takes, is we don't care necessarily about the level of the, or the nature of the singularity. We want a notion of evolution that goes through singularities and characterizes everything uh, in one way. And of course, uh, when you have something uh, that goes through singularities and it doesn't feel it, it's going to be weak. All right? And then you can add to that singularity, the theory, you can add to that regularity and try to say how much regular. So it's the other way around. Now, from the point of view of the geometers, um, uh, this is, um, you may say, it's below their dignity because they, they care really about the, um, the singularities. And I have a story where, with a very famous geometer, uh, we was uh, ages ago, we were in a restaurant eating, and uh, there, was, there were another geometer and something else. And, and um, the person, uh, the famous person asked me, uh, what are you working on? And I said, at that time I was working more on mean curvature motion. I said, motion by mean curvature. He says, fantastic. Let's talk about it. And, uh, and the other, the younger geometer said, well, you know what he does? He does weak solutions. And the famous geometer said, ah, okay, forget it. I mean, there's no reason to talk. Uh, so uh, having said that, let's start um, the level set uh, now. Uh, the level set is uh, as, uh, attributed to Osser and Sethian. And if you ask Osser, it's attributed only to him and not to Sethian, because he thinks that Sethian did not do much there, but really goes back to previous observations. Neither of the two develop, uh, discover level sets. Uh, there was actually a paper by a guy at MIT before that where we were discussing this, and then a paper of, uh, of uh, Gibal who was looking at problems on uh, uh, combustion, and he had come up with this. So what is the idea? The idea is I have a set here, gamma t, and any time I write this, I will not be talking just about the boundary. Uh, for me, everything is going to be three sets the front, the inside, the outside. And uh, we are going to assume that it mo involves, in, for now, very concretely, with the normal velocity, which is as normal, a function of the, I want to use, I have three different notations. I need to remember uh, which one I want to use now before I get it. Uh, yeah, so with the prescribed normal velocity. So let's say this depends on uh, the normal, the curvatures, uh, the direction x and t. Okay, so n is the, the normal vector. I assume everything is smooth, and I want to describe the evolution of that. And the canonical examples we will be using will be one, basically. This will be trace of, uh, for today, plus, uh, let's say, a of xt. So that's mean curvature plus uh, first order term. And I put the minus sign. We are interested in, uh, in something that obeys the maximum principle and things like that. So spheres, uh, balls are shrinking, so I have to put the minus there. And then the, idea, the observation of the, of the level set theory is to say, OK, that's what you want to study. Let's assume that the gamma t is really the level set, level set at time t, the zero level set of a function uh, u, and then let's take omega t to be the place where u is positive, and of course that becomes the set where x is whatever, it's u is negative, 
So we assume this. Uh, let's also assume that u is smooth. So all these things are assumptions. Huh? I mean, this is formal derivation. Uh, u is smooth. And uh, let's also assume that du is not 0 on gamma t. And then try to express this in terms of the function u. So you, you um, an advice for the students. At some point in your career, introduce a notation and stick with it. If you don't, uh, especially with signs, uh, right now, uh, there's a big confusion in my mind what is plus and what is minus in terms of this because I never paid any attention. You know, I wrote the paper and then I copied. And I, I, and I never, so what is the notation? So the normal velocity, okay, so what's the idea? The idea is that think of particles, you don't care what is happening on the surface. So if you take an element, an point on the surface, it's moving around in space. You don't care what it does while you are on the surface, you only look at the normal direction. And so in that case, the evolution, the vt, will be ut over, ut over gradient u. OK, the du will be uh, like uh, the normal vector will be uh, this. And the gradient of the normal vector, the curvature is going to be this. So you take all that stuff, uh, you write it, uh, you take this relationship, and you find that ut has to be equal to du uh, times v. And let me not rewrite everything that goes in there. OK, so you just take this, and you put it inside there. And this is going to involve uh, second derivatives of u, first derivatives of u, space time, if you like. So doing that. I'm a disaster with chalk, so. You will construct an equation that looks like that. So what is f? I can write it down. f is um, uh, f of x, p, x, t will be what you get uh, will be p. And then uh, uh, here you put uh, whatever else you have. So here you're going to put identity minus uh, p cross p. So p hat, to simplify things, would be p over length of p over p square. Sorry for that. I'll get it right. OK, so that's the f that you get from here. Now you make another assumption for the model that not only the 0 level set of the function moves with this law, but you make the assumption that all level sets of u move with the same velocity. Which means that u will satisfy everywhere this equation. And we'll start with some initial condition ux0 of x where u0 uh, the place where u0 is 0 is our initial front, and the omega 0 is the place where u0 is positive, and of course that is the place where u0 is negative. 
So derivation, very simple. You have a particular motion. And in the example, let, uh, let me write down what it is for that case. For that case, the PDE will look like trace identity minus du tensor du hat uh, d square u plus alpha xt a, a, I'm sorry, maybe minus the way I put it. So that's the equation in a concrete way. This equation up here gives me this uh, level set. And as I said, I'm almost positive it's minus, but you know, if it turns out to be plus, it doesn't matter for the theory. Um, OK. Uh, and you may have seen the same equation, forget the A. You, this, you may have seen it. In the case that u is uh, in the case that u is uh, a zero, that's the same equation. So this is a nonlinear equation that um, um, we got it uh, through this modeling, and we made some more assumptions. We came down to that, and there are several issues with it. Um, notice there is a singularity. when du is 0. So you need to make out of that, sense out of that. And this is not an equation in divergence form. So it, it's not something that you can solve by integrating by parts. And that's where you need um, the theory of uh, viscosity solutions to make sense out of the, of the that. And let's say the theorem you have here is, uh, let's start with the comparison principle, which for now you take it for granted, that uh, if uh, u and v are upper, uh, are uniformly continuous, so u, c, Starts with stands for uniformly continuous in R D, and one data is less than the other. Then the solutions indeed are ordered. So for now, you accept this and think of it as a, as a maximum principle. And it is a maximum principle because the argument will be uh, in, in the right way that uh, you look at the maximum of u minus v, and at the maximum you have an order for the derivatives and uh, everything, and uh, it's going to work. But of course, what I didn't say, that it's a fundamental assumption here. So fundamental assumption. is that you need to have ellipticity. So when you come down to this problem, you need to know that this problem is elliptic degenerate. OK? We don't care whether it's degenerate. And this is a degenerate elliptic problem. So I assume you saw uh, uh, at some point last week the degenerate the ellipticity. So we say that f of x, p, and whatever is um, uh, uniformly elliptic if um, if this matrix is uh, I'm writing it as if f were smooth, but then you can write this thing in a in a, um, in, a in a different ways. Is if okay? Let me put degenerate. That's it. Generate elliptic if, if x is less equal y in the sense of symmetric matrices, then f of x is less equal f of y. It's a greater or equal f of y. No, it's less equal. Okay, it's like the Laplace. Yes. 
Okay, you're going to have to be louder. Is there a for monotone in this, uh, in, uh, it has to be monotone in this argument. Okay, I will say something maybe in the next lecture that says that if you want to have a front evolution such that it has a comparison principle, in that sense, and comparison from the front evolution means an inclusion principle. So it means that if you start with uh, uh, two sets, one inside the other, and you want them to stay like that, then you have to have a degenerate ellipticity. You have to have monotonicity to that. So I'm imposing the, the, here the, notion, the, the idea that I will have to have the comparison. Say it again. All right, comes with a little bit gray hair, difficulty. Yes, so like a symmetric matrix. That's what I mean here. When I write that, is in uh, the sense of symmetric matrices. Everybody's okay with this? So that's a big assumption. All right, so let's review what I did so far. I start with something smooth. I made some assumptions. I came down, uh, I rewrote in terms of that smooth functions, uh, a smooth function, uh, what it means to move with this normal velocity. Um, then I made the extra assumption that not only that set, the zero level set, but any, any level set of u moves with the same velocity, so you don't have this equation only when u t equals, only on u equals zero, but on every set. So that means you're going to get a PDE in all of our d, and that's the PDE. Now, what I didn't say is, once you come down to that, you forget all your assumptions, uh, then, namely that u was a smooth, uh, the level set was smooth, and so on. And you say, okay, now I have an equation that I can describe globally in time. That's the viscosity theory that I mentioned. This equation now holds as a viscosity solution. This problem has a global in time solution. So now we look at, uh, look at um, one. And I should have said here, if u0, so existence, if u0 is uniformly continuous in Rd, then there exists a unique U. Okay? And that's global in time in, um, in Rd cross zero infinity. And uh, we're going to say, in view of that definition, that the triple uh, use omega zero, gamma zero, uh, omega zero complement moves with normal velocity v uh, if omega t is the set where u is positive, gamma t is the set where u is zero, and gamma zero and omega, okay, is clearly that, and u solves star uh, provide with u0 such that omega is zero. So I'm going to write this. I'm going to start abbreviating now this thing. I'm going to go, no, not, not continue rewriting these three things. So that's our definition. So no regularity now, nothing. We, uh, no uh, assertion that this, uh, the, the set omega, this set is a nice set. Uh, and no assumption, no assertion even that the set is a, is, a, um, uh, is a boundary, I mean, is a boundary of something, but it can be as complicated as a boundary of something, right? So th what you get this way is that the, the set is the boundary of some open set, but has this property. Okay, so the problem, the, the theory is as general as this. Okay, now are there any flaws? And for that, we need to assume the uniform ellipticity. I mean, the degenerate ellipticity, plus some other technical conditions 
on uh, the way the F depends on X and T and so on. But let's stick with this. All right. Uh, do you see anything that looks weird in what I did? Or something that, um, uh, you know, needs to be... Um, Okay, so let me pose the following question. Is, is the evolving people of sets unique? So if I'm interested in this, in this property, If I'm interested in that, is this unique? Um, what do you think? All right, the easy answer is when someone asks you this question is it better be because otherwise I wouldn't be standing here to, to present it. So we know the answer is yes, but where, why am I making a point about that? Where, where is a flaw? or what am I missing the way I'm describing things? So let me be a little bit more suggestive about the way we solve this problem. We were given omega zero, gamma zero, omega zero closure complement. What did we do? We find a function u zero such that, where, where did it go? We found the function u zero that uh, had the property that uh, omega zero is the positive level set, uh, that's negative, and that's zero. Okay? So this is omega zero, this is omega zero complement. This is a multi D picture, but it's better seen like that. And that's a good U zero. But this is an equally good U0. OK, I assume this thing is uniformly continuous. All right? Uh, or for all I care, OK, this is not continuous, but the theory extends to that. That's another function that is 0 and so on. So uh, yes, the PDE, what I wrote here about the PDE is correct. An equation with these properties has a unique solution. Um, but as a motion here, in principle, for every u0, where did the equation go? For every u0, I get a different ut, u, and therefore I get a different front. So, yes, but we need another observation or another assumption. It's not an assumption when I get an F that is derived by a V that has this property. But if someone had given you an F, forget how you find the F. I walk in and say, I want to describe the motion, um, and, and I give you an F here. So if I ask the following question, I give you an F. Uh, in such that, that the problem has a comparison principle. Then define um, this for the initial data and this for the solution. Is this unique? For example, why not? That's an elliptic problem. I don't come from there. Now I'm asking a PDE question. And the PDE question is, I solve this problem, degenerate elliptic, and I'm asking the question, uh, are the level sets uniquely de determined? In other words, do this function, are these functions going to give me different solutions? And if I do it for the heat equation, the answer is yes, different things. So it doesn't hold.
So it doesn't hold for our best uh, possible PD. Okay? And it's good that it doesn't hold because otherwise there was going to be something too, too, too weird. Um, so the extra assumption we need, the extra assumption is that F has to be geometric, what we call geometric, which is a code word for the following property that Nothing. Here I'm not assuming. I'm just, this is now a property of a PD which says the following. Okay. If I solve this problem with initial data u0 and then uh, uh, the sets where u is positive and so on depend, I will use the word strongly although I'm not going to quantify that strongly on U0. Ah, okay. okay, that's the property I'm, I'm stating. Uh, okay, and that property is not satisfied by the, uh, by the, I mean, it's not going to be true with the heat equation, so let me write down what geometric means. Uh, means that if I put a P here, an XT, so if I dilate in the gradient vector and the and the met, and the second and the matrix of the second derivatives, I get I get degree one homogeneity, positive homogeneity, but there is an additional property that the equation doesn't see this tensor in in uh, in the um, In the, in the co-normal direction. Okay? So it's independent of that. And that tells you that basically you are degenerate on the surface and you are not degenerate when you move in the normal direction. Okay? Now let's check that for the heat equation. So what is the claim? If this holds, if we have this assumption, which we will call geometric, uh, then uh, the evolution of omega zero, gamma zero, omega zero complement is unique. So I will show you that, why it's the case. So meaning this question, this thing is unique. So it depends, it's independent of how you, you mark the initial set and you only do that. Okay, so um, a simple calculation. Why isn't it uh, uh, this geometric? Because the geometric property will be that lambda x uh, plus nu uh, p tensor p is uh, independent of nu and positive homogeneous of degree one in, in capital X. And you see that uh, once you have this thing here, this cannot be like that, no matter what. This has to be true for all x and, and, and p. And on the other hand, if this was the mean curvature motion, so if this was a trace, uh, it was, uh, what did I do here? Oh, if I read it correctly. So if this was a trace, if our f, of x and p was the trace of the identity minus p tensor p, p square x. It's a simple exercise to check that f of x plus mu p cross p of p is the same 
as f of x and p. So exercise. It, it just kills this thing. And of course, the positive homogeneity is automatic there. OK. So now the real question is, why does this imply this uniqueness? So I'd like to show you that, because it's different. It is the, is the, the When I teach, usually I go like that because I lose the origin. So I wanted to make sure there's one here. Um, so that's what we're going to do. That's gone. Notice I'm, I'm, I have hidden everything about, I'm not talking about regular solutions. Huh? These are just uniformly continuous solutions. So I'm, uh, the equation here is, de is described in a very weak sense, all right? Not even almost everywhere. It's a very weak sense definition. But here is a lemma that uh, f is geometric implies that if u is a solution, as a matter of fact, it's equivalent. If u is a solution of star, and you have a function phi uh, from uh, r into r, non-decreasing. Then phi of u also solves star with initial data. So the result is that any increasing function of a solution remains a solution. And that follows its equivalent to geometric. And I will use this, which is a triviality to prove, because assuming everything is smooth. Let's assume I'm dealing with things that are everywhere. They are smooth. They are not, and one has to justify that in the viscosity sense and so on. Um, and why is that? OK, proof in, in uh, So uh, again, for those who don't know viscosity solution, which seems to be the majority of the people, uh, viscosity solution theory allows me to do uh, anything I can do when the thing is smooth, allows me to do it when it's not smooth. And so proof of that is, uh, let's call this, uh, let me use the inverse, let's call uh, u psi of v. E. It's easy to do the computation like that. Then I plug it in and I get psi prime of V V T equals F of psi prime of V D square V. I'm just writing down the equation. So I'm writing the equation for, for U uh, like that. Okay, from now I'm going to start forgetting the x and t. So this is the equation. Okay, so if u is summing a function of psi of v, psi, uh, and u solves the star, uh, v has to solve this equation. And now you see that things are simple. If it is geometric, this is not there. This is just a straight calculation you do when you compute the Hessian of a function, of the function of a function. And, uh, and then you are left with psi prime, psi prime, psi prime, but the um, uh, homogeneity, the positive homogeneity allows me now to take off this term. And I got the same equation. Okay. And if you like to check it in, in uh, now, the statement that the heat equation is not geometric is very simple because if you do the same computation for the heat equation, you're going to get phi double prime du square, and there's nothing you can do with that. Okay? 
So again, if you compute for the heat equation, the same computation will give, is going to give me psi, psi prime V, Vt equals, equals psi prime V plus psi double prime dV square. And uh, now you see that um, you have a problem. Now, if anybody can eliminate that, tell us, because then those of us who give the lectures, we do not earn our money not to come here only, but so far in our careers. So this doesn't go away, right? And that's the difference. But that's at the technical level. Now, let me describe to you, now let me give you a rigorous proof based again on comparison principles or whatever, why this, this, this property, not that one, that is almost rigorous, why that property implies uh, that the level sets are independent of the initial data. Okay, so here's a proposition. So we assume always now, I'm not going to keep rewriting. From now on, we assume degenerate elliptic geometric. Uh, if uh, U and V solve star and U0 positive is the same as V0 positive, U00 is the same as V, and therefore the third would be true, then Ut positive is the same as V positive and the other two. So why is that true? To do that, we devise, we need to come up with uh, a function that if you like, takes positive sets, positive level sets of U0 to positive level sets of V0, right? So a map that takes you, take, it takes the sets, uh, not the set, yeah, it takes uh, sets with certain, um, certain level sets, two of U to level sets of V. And if we manage to make such a change with an increasing function, so we let it go, because now the U and V being solutions phi, if this increasing function is phi, then phi of V will be a solution. But that means that phi of V will be positive when U is positive, because this thing just measures level sets. All right, so let me write it down. And let me see whether I remember it. So, let's call phi of T the infimum of V0 of Y of when U0 of Y is greater or equal T. And since basically I'm going to prove, uh, to prove the equality, I have to prove two inclusions. I have to do it the other way. And this thing is the soup of U, U0 Y when V0 Y is uh, less equal T. Okay, so this is U0 and the positive, which of course is the same, and this is also where V0 is positive. So what I do is I take a T, let's say T is positive, I take a T level set of U0, and I assign to that the smallest that phi V0 can be there. All right, so again, this is a T level set of U0. So here is U0 is bigger than T. And I assign, I define as my function f of T to be the infimum, my uh, minimum, whatever, of the U0, of the V0 here. And the same thing, but the, the opposite for the supremum. And uh, why do I put infant soup? Because if I'm outside the set, these sets will be unbounded, and therefore the, the omega t or the omega zero complement, omega zero bar complement um, will be unbounded, so I have to put infant soup. 
Now, it's a simple exercise that phi and psi are non-decreasing. When I state this theorem here, I should have said non-decreasing continues for that. They are non-decreasing, but they are not continuous. Okay, in principle, they are uh, upper and lower semi-continuous functions. But let's forget that. Okay, I do that. Now, where do I use the assumption that the level sets are the same? This comes from here. Phi of zero is equal to psi of zero. This is a consequence of that. Why? Because the zero, if I look at the place where u0 is strictly positive, and I take the infimum uh, of the, the v0 there, it's going to be zero, because v0 is greater or equal to zero on the same set. Okay? So, then that implies, let me really put it down the right way, uh, uh, implies that um, by comparison, This will imply that phi of v will be less equal u, less equal psi of v. Okay, there are two increasing functions. v is less equal u initially, because it's the infimum of the values there. So I get this inequality, and this gives us the answer. Okay, so check that. Comparison means we need to show that phi v0 is less equal u0 is less equal psi v0. All right, let me change that. So that's part of the definition. And, uh, and uh, so, and then um, you plug in the comparison. This is true for t positive. And then that implies the claim. Okay, I'll let you check that. But to do that was very important that these functions we built had that property. OK. So, so far, so good. We have a definition. We have a unique evolution in time of these things. And uh, uh, it's normal to ask here, uh, what kind of sets are these omega t's? This set I call here. Uh, I, I said they are not uh, manifolds, there is nothing in principle, uh, but what kind of sets are there, are these? And so to do that, let's test some examples. So I assume that you heard about Gratian's uh, theorem last time, that, uh, okay, so that if I have a, a nice convex uh, curve or whatever, and I let it move by mean curvature, that remains smooth till it disappears. So let me say like that, goes to a point that becomes empty. So you learned things like that last week. Uh, so, uh, right, so curve moves by, that's omega t, uh, boundary of omega t is smooth. Then it goes, eventually reduces to a point and disappears. So that's the good case. So I'm not going to draw uh, pictures like that. Uh, uh, I'll draw some, but let's go now to the next case, which again is like that. I have a ball. I let it move by mean curvature. This is a special case of that. Uh, it disappears. And as a matter of fact, for here, the motion, if I have a, bo a ball of radius R0, Moving by mean curvature means that RT is minus N minus 1 over R. Okay, uh, D minus 1 over R. If you didn't see that last, last week, compute it. Okay, so things are great. Now, uh, let's say I put two balls arbitrarily close to each other. I mean, first I put them very close to each other. Very, very close, epsilon distance away from each other. 
um, th this will shrink, that will shrink. So this will go to a smaller ball, a smaller ball, and then if they have the same radii like that, then Okay, because each one of the two balls moves independently of the other. Let me take the first example, and I'm going to draw something that is not, uh, not uh, uh, doesn't look like convex, but let's assume I have this picture. So these are, these still are balls. Okay? And, uh, but they're very close to each other. Yeah, so, and I let it move by mean curvature, so what is going to happen? This is going to pop out. And then we'll continue moving. We know what happens from there. So what if we are in a critical situation where this thing is zero and that thing is zero? So what happens if I am on that situation? So I have this figure eight. And I let it move by mean curvature. OK. And let's assume that moving by mean curvature has a, a, a mind can think. Uh, so if, it, if you are here, and you want to move by mean curvature, you are confused. You don't know which one is the normal, how to go. Do you think of this as being like that or like that? And uh, so it's like an intersection. You don't know which way to go. Some of you go that way, some of you go the other way. So that means that if we let this, so if I take now my function u0 to be positive here, here, what I will find is a picture like that, where u will be 0 here, u will be positive here, there, and u will be negative there. So what we have here is interior. And of course, um, that is not very promising because you're going to ask, okay, but what happens everywhere here? And it turns out that any set you can put here also moves by mean curvature, but I had to use a different definition. So uh, let's, uh, so, uh, okay, so you get something that is, I won't call it non, it's, uh, it's not satisfactory. You, you say something like that, and, and a lot of work uh, has been um, uh, it was done to figure out when uh, things uh, have interior or they don't, and I will give you some examples in the next lecture, and I think the most uh, general result is by Sigurd, and uh, if he wants to explain that to you, uh, um, um, I know, okay, so the question is, do you have interior? Is it 55 minutes or an hour or what? So it's uh, minutes. Okay. 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 Is this clear? The issue of interior? And you can think of other pathological uh, situations like um, two crossing lines, where again you have the same problem. You don't know what happens, and as a matter of fact, if you let this thing by move by mean curvature, you're going to see this phenomenon. Uh, and the explanation is the same. You can think of this as being two half line, I mean, two intersecting lines uh, like that, or two intersecting lines uh, like that, or okay. everything I'm saying here, uh, there, there are results. Okay, this is not just drawing pictures. And notice I'm describing mean curvature. I keep saying mean curvature. If I put a, a velocity, if I put a normal velocity, if I put an extra term, if I put mean curvature plus something, you don't have this picture because the plus something knows how to go. Right? I promise to say some things that are newer. So, uh, let me do something very dramatic now. Suppose, and of course you don't know what that means at all, but suppose I have mean curvature. I said if I put a velocity, I, I know how to go. 
So I will put a velocity. I will put a small velocity here, epsilon. But I will put here Brownian motion in time. OK, so Brownian motion. Uh, how many people know what the Brownian motion is? OK, so that's better. So it is the, from the analysis point of view, is the prototypical example of a function which is continuous and nowhere differentiable. Uh, and from then, of course, it has some probabilistic properties that are important and, and so on. Now, so let's uh, now, even how to make sense out of this, it's, an, it's problematic because that will amount to taking the equation. I, I, the level set PDE that corresponds to that will be. And this is now a stochastic PDE and, and things, so let's not worry about that. There is a theory for this. Okay, there is a viscosity theory for that. But that's the equation. Okay? So what happens to this motion if I do that? What is the effect of putting here a Brownian motion? It's the effect of putting something that changes signs, plus minus, so it gives a direction, but also does it in a very dramatic way. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm adding to the velocity plus minus infinity. Right? Brownian motion is nowhere differentiable, so the B dot is either plus or minus infinity at every point. So I'm putting here something extreme. Where is the picture? So I take these two balls, and I put something very extreme at that point, like that or like that, but huge. So what happens here? And I'm willing to put a small huge thing. All right? Epsilon is any epsilon. So what happens is you let this move by mean curvature, and things are good. There is no interior. I put it epsilon because it depends on epsilon. Huh? The epsilon is because of this epsilon. That's very dramatic, huh? You have something uh, uh, that looks OK. I mean, we know that it's pathological. The two balls touch and move by mean curvature. I add uh, an epsilon. I add something that is really huge. And somehow it selects one of the two. I would call that a stochastic selection principle. And you see that in many uh, applications in, uh, in analysis when you have uh, diffusion. So let's say you have a potential with a minimum, and you perturb the, notion, the motion by a small uh, Brownian motion. This thing is going to start going like that, and eventually will go over it, over the hump, and it will concentrate on the minimum. So, it, uh, so what I'm trying to say, suppose you had a potential like that, and you move, then uh, you have a particle that's moving, then you can get stuck here or there. But even if you are here and you start putting something, uh, m moving it around, then eventually it will go over there and you will go down to here. And somehow this is the, the picture here. So why is this happening? This happening for the following reason. Um, the two balls think that they're either like that, and they come, start coming inside, but they are coming inside like crazy because the equation there will be this plus epsilon dB. So you have to solve a stochastic ODE, and this thing will oscillate. Or they will think they are like that, so they will keep going up and down. And then a miracle happens, which has to do with the scaling properties of the Brownian motion. That, so there has to be some probability in it that by the time these things have come in and come out again, because as I said, they go in and out. The time they come back and they want to close, they get stuck by this, because this takes longer, uh, um, takes longer to close. So it goes up and it comes down again, and it's open here, but the two balls, these things start to come in, and they cannot go through. There's a barrier. So they're stuck. 
and therefore they keep moving this way, and this has to do with the scaling property. It has to do with the, uh, uh, something that goes like that. And the scaling, the fact that Brownian motion scales like t square root. So it has to do with this property. And, um, uh, and so it never closes, and that's why we get this. And now if we let epsilon go to zero, this will converge to the gamma t that was here, the maximal. Okay. So uh, everything, uh, all these things uh, have proofs, but uh, uh, this is going to be, this is a more complicated, I don't even know where I am. This is a more complicated thing to, to prove. But at least I'm trying to give you uh, the idea. And, um, okay, so there is this issue of interior. And of course, we are not going to, to exclude it by putting the epsilon here. So uh, the theory, at least for mean curvature, was like, um, uh, we know there are some pathological configurations, like two touching balls or two crossing planes. And if we let them move by mean curvature, we know there is interior. And then for a while, there was this classical, uh, the classical question is, if you start with smooth, but the complicated smooth, not the convex or something, um, uh, can you generate interior? And uh, so I will give you a sufficient condition not to generate interior that goes back to uh, um, one of these in quotes conjectures of De Giorgi. And then, of course, the final result was proved by Sigurd and, 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 um, and Tom Milmanen, and that was that indeed you can start with a smooth surface that comes in finite time very close to a minimal cone which is unstable, and then it comes very close to something like that, and then this takes over and creates interior. So I mentioned the word uh, conjecture of the Jordi, so that's something that uh, Giovanni may remember. Um, uh, there was a meeting in Trento with the uh, Giorgi, who is a god in Italy and, and everywhere else. And the Giorgi did not um, speak English, but I have the feeling he understood English. And he had two interpreters at that point. It was Ambrosio, I mean, it was uh, Ambrosio and Giovanni. They were his interpreters. So anytime the Giorgi went to say something, he would call them nearby, uh, talk to them in Italian, and then either Luigi or Giovanni would get up and say, what Professor Di Giorgi says, and we go like that. So uh, for some reason, towards uh, that time uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, in his career, he had become interested in, in uh, again, motion by mean curvature, and in this phenomenological uh, description and the connections with uh, minimal surfaces and so on. And so he had posed, posed a number of questions. And for those of us who were uh, uh, younger at that time, uh, you know, we wanted to work on these the Georgie conjectures. So we are sitting in a big table at, uh, at Trento, and that's Villa, we were up there. And uh, someone, I don't remember who, but they were, it was me there, it was Sonner and some other people, uh, used the word uh, the Georgie conjecture, one of the Georgie's conjectures. So one of the Georgie's conjectures was this thing about the interior. I will show you another one. And the Georgie says, no, 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 no. Says, points to, I don't remember whether it was you or Giovanni or, or Luigi. They come nearby, tells them blah, 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 blah. And so then one of the two says, Professor Di Giorgi says that he does not like to call these conjectures. He likes to call them questions. And if you want him to call them conjectures, you have to ask him what the probability he assigns on them be true or not. And uh, of course, all of us decided not to ask him because we wanted to work on the Di Giorgi conjectures. I think one of them was this famous De Georgi conjecture, which we don't even know what number uh, the one about Laplacian equals f of u, and I, we don't even know what number De Georgi uh, assigned to it. So, but like them, everybody else forgot it. So, so this generation of interior or how, uh, and so one question of De Georgi was the following. Uh, can you create interior 
if your surface, you, if, if your initial surface is invariant, in quotes, under all possible geometric transformations. So if you, had an, if you have a set, I'm talking about mean curvature, that if you rotate it, if you have a surf initial uh, function, u0, or a set, which had the property that if you rotate it, translate it, and dilate it, does not hit nearby sets. So if I have a u0, it's hard to, to, um, to draw something like that. But uh, think of uh, having some these level sets that are, are close to each other. So these are different level sets of the same function. And the George's one of the questions was, if these things are such that, that uh, even if when you rotate them, squeeze them, dilate them, dilate them or move them in time, if they don't touch each other, so there is no interior. So if gamma zero is invariant under rotations, dilations, and translations in space-time, it is then Okay. So no interior for me. I didn't give a formal definition. Means that the, use, the set where u is zero doesn't be, doesn't have. A, a, it's not an open set, or it's not. I'm sorry, it cannot be open set. It's not. Um, uh, no interior means. that the boundary of the set where u is greater or equal to 0 is the same as the boundary of the set where u is positive, and the boundary of the set where u is less or equal to 0 is equal to the boundary of the set where u is negative. That's the mathematical definition of no interior. And it turns out that if you had, um, under good conditions, that's equivalent to saying that uh, the set xt u xt equal to 0 has no interior in xt. Okay, if that's the case, uh, this is for sure. Um, or the, the yes, okay. So let me show you. Actually, I will start with this. The next hour, I want to draw one more picture. So another of the questions, of, I think it was a question of the Georgie about this. Yes. Here. So it, it's hard to draw it, but it says that if you, if you, if the, when you, you take a gamma zero, and these are the, these are, okay, so this is u zero, and this is u, uh, minus epsilon, u epsilon nearby sets. And um, uh, if you take gamma zero and you rotate it, it doesn't hit any other level set if you rotate it. So there is some order on the way they are. If rotating one rotates everything. And if, the, if you dilate one, let's say they're star-shaped and you dilate one, you don't hit another one. And uh, okay? And uh, all these things, I will tell you what they mean analytically. It's not an issue. Um, one thing that maybe you heard about it has to do with um, uh, a set of, uh, if, it, if you have a set with a positive mean curvature, initially it, it, it remains nice. Maybe someone mentioned that. And that's the same as saying that in tra translations in time, uh, you don't have this property. So it's like assuming that ut at equals zero is positive. And that takes you because it stays positive, and then you have. So I will state this uh, before. Um, if I went to do at the first order velocity, if I had this picture, so if I'm moving by velocity a of x only and t, 
So my geometric PD is this, plus minus now, let's not worry about that. So now this is the case of a first order motion, there is no... Uh, there's a similar result, uh, not a similar result. There is a result that says that if A has a fixed sign, there is no interior, because if it has a fixed sign, this can, will keep increasing or decreasing. Uh, or, uh, and so there are two results. Uh, a of xt, fixed sign, or A of x, um, um, or, or no assumption. So if, if A of X independent of time, independent of T, then there is no interior. And um, so that's for the first order motion. But there is a counter example. If you look at this motion in this equation, x minus t, ux. Now notice there is a coefficient here that changes sign, and there is interior. Okay, so I will start with these things in the, in the, in, uh, the afternoon lecture. So to conclude, let me draw, do another thing with a picture. And um, so the fascination of this interior uh, led to the following question again. And I think that was a conjecture of De Georgi. Uh, maybe interior is generated if you have um, um, a motion that um, has a completely different topological structure in one regime and the other, and maybe when things come together, uh, the interior has to happen there. And this was a little bit motivated by the, the, uh, this idea of the figurator of the two balls come together. So here was an, 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 another example that, uh, suppose you have a torus, but it's a very thin torus. Thin means this is not thin, thin means like that, and you let this thing move by mean curvature. So these are dotted lines. You know? There was a time when I knew what these things, how to call them. But let's say this moves by mean curvature, so what happens? Uh, this circle wants to close. This circle wants to close. So, but this is much bigger than that, so this is going to close before the other. So if you let this thing moving by mean curvature, uh, you're going to get an even thinner thing, and at some point you're going to get a circle, which of course will disappear, and everything is nice. Now suppose you have a very fat torus. These are the bagels you like to buy if you are in the US, they give you more food. Uh, so you have a very fat torus, so, very, the, so this circle is very small compared to the other. Then you're going to have the opposite behavior. The one in the middle will close before everything else. So this uh, fat torus will become um, basically a pin sphere at some point. And then it will open up, it will become something like a sphere, and it will keep moving. And so the whole idea was, and this has, depends on the radius of uh, the ratio of the radii. And so the whole idea was that at that point, at this critical radii, you're going to have to say interior, because somehow the idea was that okay, one wants to go this way, the other wants to go that way, there will be interior. And unfortunately, this was not the case, because what happens is that uh, these two phenomena, the pin sphere or the circle, happen exactly at the same time. So there's some kind of similar solution that comes in. And, um, and so this didn't work, as an example. And that's why one needed this very nice example of Sigurd with, uh, with Ilmanen. And I think David Kropp, I don't remember. Okay, so I will start, sorry, I went further. I'm going to start 
with these things in the afternoon, and then I will do the distance function and try to show you an asymptotic uh, uh, reaction diffusion example, and then go again back to the definitions. Any questions? Ah, okay, you want to thank me first.